So we got together last night, and uh, as we did get together and shared long-term planning and, and things that were there. So this morning, we're going to start off the new year by basically saying, let's do this right. Let's start at the beginning of what it is that God really wants us to do. And some of the things that we shared last night, we'll share with you this morning. Um, again, you never know what I'm going to do. Uh, always look for the unexpected. And today we're going to give you some more. Uh, I, I don't want you to ever get to the point where you think, I've learned him now and I know what he's going to do next. <laughs> As you saw all week in uh, Facebook, um, I've been putting out little tweets. I've been tweeting all. All week, my tweets aren't like uh, the real Donald Trump uh, or at uh, POTUS. You know, I'm trying to come up with a, a real wild name for me, something like Chuck Otis or something like that, you know, but I don't know. I, you know, it, it's just, uh, I, I just tweet as, uh, if uh, you're not following, it's uh, CBC Middle, stands for Calvary Baptist Church Middletown. So we're there on Twitter. And then if you, uh, you follow either me or follow the church, you, you got the, some of the notes uh, that I was telling you about. And um, because one of the problems that we all have is that we really do want to tell people about Jesus, but we're afraid. We're, we're afraid that if I tell them about him, then they're going to ask me a question and, and I don't know the answer to it. I, I'm going to freeze up. And if I do tell them the answer, which I think I've got to give them an answer, I'm going to tell them something wrong. And may I say to you this, that every time that someone asks you a question, you don't need to know the answer to it. If you do, then evidently you're in the wrong place. Because if every one of us, if we knew the answer to all of the questions, we wouldn't be here. We would be home where the streets are golden and all of the issues and things are over. So Jesus is giving his disciples his last words in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And the problem is that we think, okay, well, those are the words that he spoke to them. And those words don't mean anything to me today. Wrong. They mean everything to us today. This is the command that not only Jesus gave to them, but these are the same commands that he gives to us this morning. And so when he begins to talk to them and share with them, he says this. He says, then Jesus came near and he said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. When I presented my sacrifice back to the Father, Jesus said, here's what the Father did. He said, well done, son. From this point, I have received your sacrifice. And from this point forward, I am taking all authority in heaven and earth, and I am now giving them to you. From this day forward, no longer will I be directing the angels, you'll be directing them. They will do whatever you tell them to do. They will go wherever you tell them to go. They will be whatever you want them to be. You 
have all authority. And when someone prays, they will pray through you to me. And I will understand what they're saying because you are interpreting. You know what they felt or are feeling. You understand what they're going through. And I can now understand because through you. So now you have all power and authority. And he says, okay, I got all power and authority. Here's what I'm telling you to do. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. When God, when Jesus gives us a promise that says, I will be with you always, that's exactly what he means. When you go over to the book of Revelation, chapter 5, in verses 9 through 14, you will find that God has a scroll. It is sealed. And he is looking for someone to un unroll that scroll and read it. He looked everywhere and couldn't find anyone worthy to do that. Until you come to verse number 9. And here's what it says. Well, let's go back to verse number 8. When he took the scroll... The four living creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. And here's what they sang. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered. And you redeemed people for God by your blood. From every tribe and language and people, and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands, plus thousands and thousands. And they said with a loud voice, The Lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in the sky say, Blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And he says, And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. One of the things that we see is Jesus leaving. And now we see in the book of Revelation, Jesus coming. Worthy is the Lamb because God has given him all power and all, all strength that is there. One of the things that happens as you get older is you begin to realize that as circumstances start happening in your life, it honestly begins to start thinking and deepening your, your thoughts about death. You see, if I knew my time to go to heaven was near through the indication of age or illnesses and everything else, the question would be, what statement would I leave to those that I love the most? What would be my last words? to them and to say to them? What challenge would I leave with them with, with the responsibility of what life is? And what encouragement would I give to them to stimulate them to accept the challenge that I gave them? You see, the resurrected Lord loved his disciples. He loved them so much, and he was leaving them his last words. He had already died. He had resurrected, and now he's going back to the Father. His task 
on this earth were finished. And he knew what only God knew. And he related to God in a way that he was a man who was triumphant. Not just over death, hell, and the grave. He was triumphant over everything. Every day of his life, the Bible says that he was tempted just like we were tempted, but yet without sin. And he knew what being triumphant meant. You see, when Jesus was born, ladies and gentlemen, there was a chorus in heaven that had came to earth proclaiming his birth. And when Jesus comes again, there will be another chorus proclaiming his coming again. And that is the ones that we're waiting for and we want to see those things. You see, because what Jesus did when we begin to look at these scriptures, we understand that he says that he has great authority. He also understands that he has a great command and he also has a great promise. But when the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go and to wait, they were waiting there to see what was, going to, what was he going to say. What was he going to do? He had already told them he's going back to the Father. I can't stay with you any longer. And I will give you my last words. And I will give you my command. But not only will I give you my command, I will also tell you that I have all authority. So whatever you need, you come to me and you ask. And he says, if you ask in the name of the Father, he says, I will give it to you. He also says that there's reasons that we don't receive. He says, because you don't ask. So many times we think that God, Jesus is stand, just sitting up there and, and, and not doing anything. Don't you understand that he's waiting to hear from you? He's waiting to see what do you want? What do you need? Not what do you want, what do you need? And do your needs match up with what I want to give you? But we don't get because we don't ask. There's a lot of times you go into a job and you keep waiting and waiting and waiting for a raise because you think, they see my work. They're doing, I'm doing a really good job. Surely they're going to give me a raise. And you've been there for three years, and finally you go into your boss, and you say, hey boss, I've been here for three years. I've done everything you wanted. And, and I would really like a raise. He says, I've been waiting to give you one, but I was just waiting for you to ask. And then you go out of there kicking yourself, thinking, if that's all I have to do, I'll be back in there tomorrow. I worked for three years without a raise and all I had to do was just go in and ask him and he said okay or she said okay. Sometimes you don't understand. God's waiting on us. And we don't get because we don't ask. He's saying, man, I, I, just, I just want to bless you. Why, why aren't you asking? And after we get blessed, then we wonder, why didn't I do this earlier? But he's given us these commands and these promises. And one of the things that we need to understand was when Jesus was there, and the Bible says that he was transfigured. They, we begin to see there were two men with him and they thought it was Moses and Elijah that had actually come to converse with him. But Jesus, when he was there, one of the things I, I think you understand is that Peter, James, and John never forgot that moment. I guarantee you that every day that they lived, they remembered the moment that they saw Jesus leaving and going back to the Father. But not only did they remember the moment, they remember the words. Because think about it. When somebody close to you has died, what do you remember the most about them? The last words they said to you. What was the last words? 
I was with my dad in 1976 in October on a Saturday. I'd gotten home from the service in Germany and they had, they had called and said, you need to get home because your dad's sick. My father had had a heart attack on Sunday evening. I got out of Germany on Tuesday morning. I didn't get back into uh, the States until Thursday. I get there and I go straight to the hospital and we were all with my dad from Thursday to Saturday. I was with him all, all the time from Thursday to Saturday. Left for a few moments. But I remember the last thing he said to me. My dad, as I've shared with you, my dad was a guy that liked to read the journal news. He liked the Dr. Pepper in a Milky Way bar. And that's where I get my Coke and Reese cup. Okay? That's one of the traits that I have of my father. Is that. So my dad was there and they come in and they said he's, he's doing better. We're going to move him out of ICU and we're going to move him upstairs to another room. He's turned a corner, everything's fine. I went in with my dad and he's laying there and, and I said, Dad, you want me to read the newspaper for you? I've got your Dr. Pepper in a, in a Milky Way and you're doing better. Because I, I'd like to do this and I need to go home for a few, to go to Diana's mom and dad's to take a shower because I hadn't showered since like Monday. I'm beginning to stink after three days, you know. And so I said, you know, I'd like to do this and, and, and then I'll leave you for a few moments and I'll, I'll come back real quick and, and I'll be up to see you in, in your room. And he looked at me and he, and he says, uh, he says, Charlie, I'm tired. I just want to sleep. Um, I'll see you later. My father was never a person to just tell you goodbye. Could never do that. It was just too sentimental and emotional for him. And he was one of those guys that did not like to break down in front of people. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll see you later. I get to... Diana's house, I took a shower, getting ready to walk out the door to go back to see my dad. I got the phone call, you need to come quick. He's taking a turn for the worse. In just that few moments, my father had another heart attack that he could not recover from. So the last words that I remember him saying was, I'm tired, I'll see you later. And those are the words that will always stick and will always be there. And we always do. Whether they're good or bad words, we always remember those last words. These disciples, every day they lived, ladies and gentlemen, they were constantly remembering the message of their Savior. Not just their Savior, their best friend the one that they had become so close to in a matter of three years, the one that they had depended on for everything for three years, they remembered his last words. And everywhere they went, these words were etched into their memory. Go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. And they knew every day, every moment of that day that they awoke, they knew that Jesus was there. They knew that he was keeping his promise. And that is the one thing that we need to all remember is that Jesus has given us the same commandment today, is to go and make disciples. And that he will be with us. One of the greatest things that Jesus said, he says, listen, you see all the things that I did? He told his disciples. He says, there's going to be more that are going to come after me. And they're going to do greater things than I did. You think about it for a minute. In the lifespan of the ministry of Jesus Christ, in three and a third years, 
when you look and count the numbers, he probably, probably, at the end of the time, I believe there was like 70, 70 or 120. Three and a half years, or third years, 120 people. You and I have got the means in the capacity to reach out and touch more than 120 people in a matter of five minutes. Think about it. Three and a third years, 120, and you have the power, have the power to reach out and see more than 120. On this day, Sunday, all across the world, in every nation, every nation, every tongue, every language, there will be more than 120 people come to know Jesus. When Jesus said, you'll do more than I ever did, he meant it. Why? Because now he's no longer confined to one space and time. Now Jesus is all powerful and he is everywhere in all of our hearts, no matter where we're at, no matter if we're in Ethiopia, Rwanda, Nicaragua, no matter if, if we're in Timbuktu in, in Pennsylvania or Middletown, Ohio, or Boone Luck, Kentucky, or Stinking Creek, Tennessee. It doesn't matter, Jesus is there. And the capacity to reach people is more powerful today than ever before. I shared with, uh, last night, every week, I get this report that says, here's how many people this week have visited every day your website at, at Calvary Baptist, uh, Baptist Church of Middletown. Over 100 people every day is touching our website. Over 200 people or clicks are going through there every day. Every day we're reaching 100 people. On a Sunday morning, when you go out and look, and this is some of the things that y'all don't realize. What happened is, we're reaching you all here. We're reaching some people on Facebook Live. But we also take our, our, our sermons today, and not only do you, do you get to listen to it, Jim is over here doing the, the language interpretation. What he does is he puts the two together. And now, our messages are going out to the deaf on the deaf websites. Two of the biggest deaf websites out there, and they're also being touched by this. So how many people are we reaching on just one service? More than 120. I get a, I get a thing every Sunday. Hey, do you know what? You can reach, uh, you can reach 250,000 people if you'll pay me $10 and I'll put it at Facebook and I will, I will take your message and get it out to 250,000 people. More than Jesus could ever reach in a moment. But this isn't just us. This is everywhere. The technology and the power that God has given us in the authority to do this. But we need to understand that what Jesus is telling us to do is to get out of the walls and to go out into the hedges and the highways. Jesus told his disciples that here, here I am. And the Bible tells us that when they saw him, they fell down and worshiped him. How many times do we fall at the feet of Jesus worshiping him? How many times do we understand that we are in the presence of God? When we come in to worship, we are here and we're doing these things that God wants us to do. They obeyed the law. The first and the second commandment that they shall have no other God before him. He is God. And they didn't worship anyone else. And what we need to understand is that if we worship him, then we should be able to go and proclaim him and tell about him and everything we do. Jesus, verse 18 begins, it says, and Jesus came up and he began to speak to them. 
when he began to speak to him and speak to them, Peter, James, and John didn't say, who's that talking to us? Do you know who that is, James? No. How about you, Matthew? Do you know who that is? They didn't ask. They knew it was Jesus speaking to them. My question to you is this, is that when the Lord speaks to you, through the, or God speaks to you through the Holy Spirit, do you know that it's him? Or are you still sitting there thinking, I'm not getting it. I don't know. I'm not sure. I know you're telling me something, but I'm just not hearing you. If you're a child of God, you have no excuse of saying, I don't hear you. Because I'll guarantee you that if you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit is telling you and you're hearing it. The question is, are you listening? Now, there's a big difference. When Diana says some things that I don't really want to hear, Okay? You pretend like... What did you say? And she generally will say, are you listening to me? She didn't ask me, did I hear her? Because she knows I heard her. And you want to know why she knows that I heard her? Because God gave me little ears. <laughs> and there's a song out there, little ears, be careful what you hear. He doesn't say anything to you all that have big ears, so you're okay. <laughs> it's only to us that have little ears because they're like supersonic hearing, you know. It would, I, I, was, I was preaching over in Richmond, Indiana, and, and uh, I, I had said something. And two ladies were conversing back and forth about what I had just said. And I said, I heard you. And they said, oh, you did not. And I told them a word for word what they said. And from that moment on, they never, ever said another word in church. <laughs> I come in here and I preach a sermon. And some of you will all will say, were you at my house? Did, did you hear what I said this week? And I'll say, no, but I've been listening. Actually, God's been listening. And, and God, God, God is great. Can I tell you all this? Can I tell you this? The worst person to ever tell a secret to is God. <laughs> he shares it. Y'all in trouble. Remember what he said? He, he said that your sins will find you out and they'll shout it from the rooftop. <coughs> Be careful. <coughs> Be careful. He loves, he, loves, he loves these things. So when Jesus said, listen, all authority is given to me, Jesus told them, he says, listen, you need to come here. And, and, and what would happen? You think about it. Jesus healed people. I, uh, I know there's people that say, well, you don't go to the doctors. I, I trust in God. I trust in God too, but I also trust that God's given me some common sense every once in a while that I need to take something for something in order to get better. You, you know, I, I, I love it with these people who, who say, I'm not going to take any medicine. <laughs> and I want to say, get away. You're cursed. You, you know, come back when you feel better in like 28 years. You know? There are great things that are there. And, and, and not only does he have the authority, we talked about the command. In the 1930s, the French built a, this, this place, it was called the Fame Magnolia Line, and it was a great defense against the Germans. And what, what they thought that they would do is they would build this fortification out of concrete barriers and bunkers. bunkers. And they thought that Okay, the Germans are going to be able to attack, but they will never be able to do anything with it. It's concrete. Was thicker and the guns were heavier, 
than any of the world had ever seen. But what had happened was the French, when they had built this line, they didn't, they didn't count on the Nazis doing what they called a blitz attack which was like a lightning war, a rapid plan. That, that they emphasized the speed and the mobility to get in there and do it quick. They just thought it's gonna be typical, like, okay, we're gonna attack somebody, so what do we gotta do? We gotta get these orders out. It's gonna take us a long time to mobilize everybody, and by the time they get mobilized and start coming, we'll know that they're headed, so we've got a lot of time to prepare for this. They weren't prepared because Hitler, one of the things that he was very capable of doing with his, with his Nazi army was being able to get it in different places and mobilize it very quickly and attack before you ever had a time to, to lay down a defense. It was like blitz. And, and, and this is the same thing they use in football, remember? When you want to get to the quarterback, what do you do? You, it's an all out. Everybody just rush. And before he has time to throw it, you've already tackled him, and, and so they weren't prepared for it. And this is the same way it was. And so what happened was that after all of this big, huge concrete walls and all of these guns, what was left of this wall and this guns was the Nazis had overrun France. And that big wall was nothing but a bunch of concrete rubble laying there as a monument saying you can't do it. We need to understand that what Jesus is asking us to do, ladies and gentlemen, is blitz. He's asking us to do an all-out attack on the enemy into the world and the marketplaces and telling people about Jesus. He tells us we are commanded to go and to make disciples. He didn't ask us if we wanted to. He says it is imperative and the command is go. He didn't say if you like it, you can do it. No, it doesn't happen that way. I gotta keep watching my watch. Okay, and then what did he do? He says, I promise you this. I promise you that I will be with you when you go. So now here's what we're doing. I need some help. Sorry, we just pause for the cause. <laughs> Thank you. I should have enough for everybody. So let me ask you this question. And you don't have to raise your hand but you need to answer this question to yourself. When was the last time that you actually shared Jesus with somebody? When was the last time you talked to somebody about their life? When was the last time that you shared with somebody your testimony of what Jesus has done to you? We don't share because we're afraid. We're afraid because we don't have the answers, and, and you're right. You, you don't have all of the answers. I don't have all of the answers. But what if I could show you that you could take these. There are five of them. You all are here, and you all have them. I know exactly who's here tonight, today. We've got your name, and I got your numbers. 
So I don't know how many people are here, but let's say there's 60. Okay, in here I don't know, but let's just say there is. 60 times five is 300 people that can be reached in one week. I guarantee you that's more than you've probably reached in the last year. So, I've got a three minute video that will show you how easy it is to reach five people this week. You can actually do it in probably five minutes. Hi there, I'm Jesse, the founder of TrueLife.org, and we're here at Thomas Road Baptist Church to help show you how easy it is to evangelize and invite people with these TrueLife.org invitation cards. It's good to see you guys. Happy to be here. Thank you for coming. So we're encouraging evangelism and invitation in churches, not just Thomas Road Baptist Church, but your church as well. I'm sure your pastor probably gave you a TrueLife.org card today to hand out. And these cards are so unique because it takes the fear away from evangelism and invitation. That means that we don't have to be afraid of the questions that might be asked or the time it's going to take. We're not having a starting point. What if the recipient is afraid of going to church? Well, they can easily go online and get free video answers to questions like, how do we get the Bible? Why do bad things happen? Where do you go when you die? Does God love gay people? Is Mormonism true? Are Jehovah's Witnesses right? And the list goes on and on for any worldview. And then, of course, they can easily find your church on the church finder. Hey, Will, so we're pulling up to a gas station right now, and all I need you to do is just go out and simply say, hey, I'd love to have you come to my church on Sunday. If you have any questions, you can go online and get video answers, okay? Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> God bless you, I'm praying for you, okay? Let's see what happens. Hi, excuse me, how you ladies doing? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, I don't know if you go to a church anywhere in the area, but I'd like to invite you to Thomas Road Church, see here. And, uh, and if you don't have any time to make it to church right yet, you can see on the back, uh, truelife.org, where you get free video answers to life's hard questions. And there's all kinds of different videos on there to answer questions that people have, like, is there a God? And why do we suffer? And things like that. So awesome. take a look at it. Thank Remember you. the Lord loves you. Hey, well, do you feel better right now? I mean, do you feel relieved that, you know, at first you feel like a little bit... A little nervous at first, yeah. yeah. But now I know you, I'm, I've given opportunity to people to find answers in God's Word. And that's, that's exciting, you know? That's awesome. Well, you did a great job. And, and they seem to be very open to it. Sure. You know, Would you suggest the same for people watching? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Go out and do it. It's easy. Katrina, it's your turn. Oh, yes. We're going to have some fun. Yes. You ready to do this? Yes. I'm We're a bit nervous, go... though. You are? Yeah, I'm a little nervous for you, too. I know you're going to do well, though. Because yeah, um, so I've I'm... never done this before. I always <laughs> wanted to, but I'm nervous, but well, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm praying for you, sister. I know you're going to do fun. Here we are. This is good. Hey, you want to talk? You can talk to her. Hi. How are you? Good. Yeah. This is, I would love to come, uh, you to come to my church next week. No, I don't week. go to your church. I don't care. You don't go to church? You know, you can go online too if you want to. Do, you know. Yeah. Okay. God bless you. So we, what you do is just keep going. Okay. Yeah. And someone else, will, someone else will take the card yeah. since she didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Do you go to church? Sometimes. Oh, great. That's good. So I would love to see you. I mean, come over to my church next week. And um, if you, for some reason, if you, if you, I mean, you're not ready, you can always go onto this website, like truelife.org, and uh, there are some free video answers. Okay. But there are a lot of questions we have sometimes, and there are a lot of videos explaining those questions, and you can always go and check those videos and have the answers. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's nice meeting you. Have a great day. God you best. too. Yeah. Hey, Will. Yeah. Man, we had a great time in there. Oh, yeah. Katrina surprised me. I mean, I, I knew she was going to do good, but she did really, really good. Thank you. <laughs> you did. Well, you know what happened? What happened? Uh, initially, there was um, one lady who didn't, um, you know, didn't want to take the card. Yeah. And she was like, no, I'm not going to come to church. And I was really, you know, <laughs> but then I didn't give up. Yeah. And he was with me, and we went on ahead, and we gave the cards to a lot of people. And surprisingly, it was really, it wasn't really hard, and no. they were really receptive, and I loved it. Yeah. Yes, well, I'm so thankful 
that you just did my job. I don't have to explain nearly as much anymore to you back in the sanctuaries. We're not a different person than you. We are made in God's image just like you are. And every Christian has the opportunity to do this. And I can promise you from the bottom of my heart that there is nothing better than to share your faith with people. So I'm challenging you today, share your faith, hand out these cards, and see what God can do in your life and in the lives of others. See how easy? It's not that hard. Do me a favor, Mark, if you would. Uh, I need you to bring up a website, uh, truelife.org. And I'll show you, because this isn't just, this website isn't just for people who are um, non-Christians. This website can also be used for you, uh, for questions that you may have. And, and I'll, I'll show you real quick as we get this thing up. But you will hit some people that will tell you, I don't, I don't want it. I don't want to have anything to do with church. And, and you're probably going to want to quit. Especially if that's the first person that you hit. You probably want to say, I, I'm done. God, I'm finished. I knew this was going to be a disaster. But let me share it with you. If you go into the grocery store, I guarantee you that by the time you get out of that grocery store, you can get rid of all five cards. And when you get to the checkout and they ring you out, you won't feel so bad about how much you spent. <laughs> because you're going to be so high and excited about the people that you've talked Okay, this is what you see, is you find video answers to its, its hard questions, or life's hard questions, and, and those are all there. Uh, these are, I, I forget exactly how many hundreds of videos are there, all kinds of stuff. I, I know it's kind of hard to see, but it's things like um, forgiveness. Um, it, you'll see the Jesus film, uh, or do, do you have true life? Uh, abortion, archaeology, abuse. Uh, why does God allow abuse? Uh, the Bible. How did, how did we get the New Testament and the Old Testament? We we're sharing about that. Uh, are there errors in the Bible? Uh, what about the translations? Christianity, what, what's a Christian's uh, worldview? The church, why do I go to church? Uh, the Da Vinci Code, which was one of the things that a lot of people were watching. Death, what happens when I die? Uh, depression, evil, evolution, God, heaven, and on and on and on and on it goes. Okay, continuing on. If you go back to the top, of that mark and what you'll find is up there it says find the church in the green okay and, and what it'll do is it'll say search for the zip code and here's what I showed to them last night and here's what I want you to do uh, type in our zip code mark and do a search we are the only church in the Middletown area that's doing this no other churches is doing this. Uh, they partnered with a guy uh, who has who now gone home to be with the Lord, a guy by the name of Bill Bright. Bill Bright uh, was for Campus Crusades for Christ. And then he got, um, I forget exactly, I want to say five or ten million dollars as, a, a, as an honor for a year that he did this thing. And, and so what he did was he took that that millions of dollars that he had and he created what was called the Jesus film. I've got 200 copies of the Jesus film coming for you to hand out to people and just tell them watch it. Okay? If you follow Joe Veal every week, they go into, they go into uh, uh, Malawi every week. You'll hear them 13,000, 20,000, 21,000 people that, that came to know the Lord. You want to know why they came to know the Lord? From the showing of the Jesus film. And after showing of the Jesus film, just talking to them about these things and, and how to get the answers. But if you look, we're the only one, the closest one, uh, the bridge was part of it in Oxford. But if you go back and look, they haven't done anything with it because they still have Chad's name on there as the pastor. And, he, and he's been gone for a long time. You, you see, Miamisburg has one, West Carrollton, Beaver Creek, up in Dayton. You come down a little bit further, there's one in Sharonville, one over by uh, Loveland, and one over by Northgate. You look at how many churches there are in this region. And can I tell you something? These did not cost me a dime. 
I actually got 1,000 of them already printed, and I've got 2,000 more that I can print before, whenever I want them. And then what, what else is happening is um, the Southern Baptist churches, along with a lot of other churches all around, all around the nation and the world, are doing a thing called the Big Invite for Easter. So what we're doing is another big push to invite. But what I'm doing is I'm pushing every week that you guys take these cards and hand them out to people. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm forewarning you, I will ask you next week, what did you do with your cards? But I'll forewarn you because I'm asking you those questions on Facebook that will a gently reminder, a gently nudge, hey, have you, have you, have you hit, passed out your cards? Have you done this? Um, there's a thing that has been going on now for two years. It's called um, Ladies' Night Out here in Middletown. And Jerry is always after, she's always after me, Chuck. She says, I know you really like to reach out into the community. You really like to do some things. And one of the things we talked about last night was evangelism and outreach in this church full bore this year. Because we looked at what we did last year and we did what exactly we wanted to do. I think we accomplished exactly what we wanted to accomplish. What we wanted to do was bring a, 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 the church back together into a closeness. And we did that very well with all of the events that we did and everything dealing with fellowship. And, and, and you guys on Wednesday night coming in here, that, that come on Wednesday night and we sit down and eat. I, I sit back a lot of times and I just observe and I watch the people as they begin to talk to each other and share with each other and, 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 and everything. And it's totally exciting. So now what are we doing? We're, we're reaching out into evangelism and outreach like we've never done. Uh, we've already got a trip planned going out to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, it's like a two-day travel out and a two-day travel back and we'll spend three days there. But we're going out there to be with a guy by the name of uh, Michael Kirby. Uh, Michael and his group are coming from Santa Fe. They're coming here for a week and we're trying to iron it out as we begin to say, okay, what can we do to reach people? And ladies and gentlemen, may I say this to you? It is not an option. It is a command. A command that Jesus told us. And the reason why? Your grandkids and my grandkids if the Lord doesn't come back before they get basically our age, only 4% of them will be in church. You see smaller churches all over the place closing their doors and they're going to big mega churches. Okay? There will be big mega churches and there may be some smaller churches, but what you're going to find is that churches are dying because people aren't coming. And you want to know why they're not coming? They're not being invited. The, stat, the stats are this. 70% of all people who are invited to church will come. So guess what? If you invite 300 people this week, 70% of 300 is 210 people. That's awesome. Third service, fourth service, who knows? But let me share with you, we did this for um, Back to Church Sunday on September the 17th, I believe it was. On that day, we had 27 visitors that showed up in our church. We did a big push for Christmas Eve, telling everyone, invite your family, your friends, and everything to come to church. We ended up on that day with 20 visitors. That's 47 visitors in just two services. Guess what? We see some of them and some of them we, we don't. But more than anything, we've spread the seed that God has told us to do. And that is what we're here for. And so, this is the first Sunday of the year, ladies and gentlemen, and we're starting it off right. We're getting out of here. And we're going to go tell people about Jesus. And we're going to invite them to come and, and share with everything. So, let's get an invitation, if you would. And here it is. I need you to do me a favor and I need you to look at your life right now. And I'm not trying to embarrass you, I'm not trying to 
and goat you into something. But I want you to be honest. If you look at your life over the last year, how much have you grown in the Lord? When was the last time, honestly, that you shared Jesus with somebody? If at all. When was the last time that you said, hey, very simple. Hey, do you go to church anywhere? I'd like to invite you to come to our church. Come check us out. You'll find out they're different. They're strange. It's not like your mom's church. But I think you'll like it. Because I think you're going to find people who are not going to judge you based upon who you are. But rather want to see you in a light in what you can become. Because it isn't me changing anyone. It is me telling them and you telling them about Jesus and letting Jesus change them. You see, we can't even change ourselves. We get in the way so many times. When God says, I need you to change this, and you say, I, I can't do that. And he says, hold on a minute. I didn't tell you to change you. I said, you need to change. Okay? But I can't do this. And he says, you're right. But I can. I can. There were a lot of times, ladies and gentlemen, I've been there and saying, I can't do this. Until I finally realized, he didn't ask me to do it. He just said, you need to change. And all I had to do was just trust him. He knew what he was talking about. And let him do the changing. Remove yourself. You can't talk to other people and invite them. It's real simple. You can do it within 30 seconds. And then you can go sweat somewhere after you're done. And go sit in your car and say, Lord, that was a, that was a total disaster. You were asking me to do this again? Are you nuts? And he says, yeah, there's your next, there's your next person. Go. But I haven't had a chance to recoup. Just go. We'll be okay. And he does. So my question to you is this. Will you make a commitment to the Lord today that God I will do exactly what you've asked me to do. I will go and tell them about you. And God, I will make disciples. I will make them because you asked me to. You commanded me to. Maybe you just need to talk to him this morning. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, come. Let us introduce you to him. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 930 with our morning worship following at 1045. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting. They're fast moving. And everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving. And we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, during the school year, we have Awana. And Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at 7. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up. Just come as you are. 
because to us it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time, and we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you, and may God bless you.